Hi, it's Debbie. I'm so excited to tell you about our new sponsor, Uplift Desks. As a therapist, I sit a lot while I work, and if I sit all day, I feel pretty terrible by the end of the day. So I love to change things up by standing sometimes while I'm working at my computer. Whether I'm checking emails or preparing for my next podcast interview, a standing desk helps me stay alert and feel better at the end of the day. Uplift Desks has a terrific selection of standing desks and other office furniture to help you work better and live healthier. You can customize your configuration to your body and your workspace. They offer free shipping, free 30-day returns and return shipping, and a 15-year warranty. And every desk purchase includes a free accessory. Remember, by supporting our sponsors, you are supporting the podcast. Go to upliftdesk.com slash POTC for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash POTC to get 5% off your entire order. Hello everyone, Michael here. Before we get started on today's interview, here's a short public service announcement for you. Your favorite Psychologists of the Clock podcast is now also available on YouTube. For those of you who prefer to listen to podcasts on that platform, you now have every single episode of Pure Awesomeness at your fingertips. I know you were already looking for your next multi-week binge, and so, well, you're welcome, my friend. Simply head over to YouTube and search for Psychologists of the Clock and subscribe. And even if you're not using YouTube to listen to us, when you subscribe, that still helps us to boost the show in the algorithm and send those big shot Hollywood agents our way so that my dream of a POTC feature film will one day come true. And you can help make that happen. And now, here's my interview with Dr. Diana Hill. For some people, the practice of self-compassion is one where you're noticing that you're struggling in this moment. Maybe you're feeling a little anxious as I am right now, a little anxiety in your body, a little heartbeat going, a little stomach feels a little upset, maybe some thoughts that are um, feeling anxious. In that moment, you could do a body-based practice. So a body-based self-compassion practice is, can I notice the, the place in my body where I feel that anxiety? And could I bring just a little bit of exhale to that spot? a little bit of loosening up, a little bit of spaciousness, a little bit of holding it with warmth. Can I imagine sort of loosening and softening around that part of me that feels anxious? That was Dr. Diana Hill on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four experts in psychology here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, a clinical psychologist practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and author of Act for Burnout, Act Daily Journal, and the Act Daily Card Deck. From America's heartland, I'm Dr. Emily Edlin, a clinical psychologist based in Chicago, Illinois, and author of Autonomy Supportive Parenting. Calling in from Vienna, Austria, I'm Michael Harold, act coach, confidence trainer, and author of an upcoming book on being a better conversationalist and making friends. And from coastal New England, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty, The Big Book of Act Metaphors, and Imposter No More. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hello, everyone. This is Michael, and I'm sitting here with Debbie to discuss my interview with Dr. Diana Hill on self-compassion. And by the way, Debbie, it feels weird to call her Dr. Diana Hill when for years she's always been um, Diana to, to us. But I guess uh, there, there are more than, there's more than one Diana out there. So uh, let yes. me be specific. What were your thoughts on, on the interview? Well, first of all, it's so lovely to hear the voice of our old friend, Diana, who people who have been listening to the podcast for a long time, of course, know that Diana was one of the people who started this podcast up and was here for many years before she decided to go a different direction. And so, you know, she always just has such wisdom to share. And I loved, it was just fun to hear her voice and, and the work yeah. that she's been doing. She's been doing so much really interesting work since she left us and how she always brings in you know, the psychological science and also, you know, she has a strong interest in the contemplative practices and how she weaves those together. So it's just lovely to hear her and to, to kind of hear what she's been up to. Um, it's always a treat. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I will say that something that the listeners from, uh, will not be able to pick up from the podcast itself, but you yeah, check, you can check the social media clips. Diana always has the most incredible background in her office. I always think it's some Photoshop, like photo virtual background. It's oh, beautiful. This is, it's yeah, the real it is. deal. <laughs> um, but uh, there's something that Diana and I actually talked about after I stopped recording uh, the interview. And we we're just chatting a little bit afterwards. And I was telling her that for my clients that work with me to build their confidence, the main takeaways at the end of our work together is either values or self-compassion. That's the big takeaway from the work. And I told her that and she immediately said, yeah, same for mine. Exactly the same. Self-compassion seems to be such a hidden gem that people are just, it's like they've never heard about it. Uh, it's its something that everyone has, has to get introduced to somehow. And I, I know that for you and your work with burnout, that must be something that um, is relevant to people as well. Absolutely. I mean, I see the world really through a burnout lens lately because of I've been so focused on that work. And I can't tell you how many times people are burned out because they have so much responsibility. They're out there in the world doing all these really hard, incredible things. And yet they feel like it's their fault that they're burned out or they just feel like they're never doing enough no matter what they're doing. And I think that often it's that self-harshness that is, it, you know, it just keeps the burnout going and digs them in deeper. And so a lot of times I try to bring self-compassion into the work and to help people see that. And it's it's interesting, though, because I think that it it can be really, really helpful and transformative. And yet sometimes people have a little bit of a resistance to it, to this concept of being a little bit kinder toward themselves and more compassionate toward themselves. And you talk in the interview about how sometimes people are worried that they'll lose that edge. And I think sometimes people think like, well, if I'm if I'm kinder to myself, am I just going to be a couch potato? Am I going to be lazy? And so on and so forth. And and I always go back to the words of Carl Rogers, who is, you know, one of the great humanistic psychologists who said, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. And how so often I think that actually when we are in that place of self-criticism and self-blame, we just ended up, we end up in a shame spiral and that isn't really where we want to go. And so I just love the concept in this interview that, that Diana shares about kind of turning that way of thinking on its head a little bit and looking at it through a new lens and, and, you know, I, I just really appreciate her her wisdom around that because she's been doing a lot of great work in this area. Yeah. Yeah, she did. It's this this idea that we, we talk about in the interview as well is the we're so harsh to ourselves, but we have much better and wiser and more compassionate words to a friend or a family member or even a stranger who's going through exactly the same thing. And all of the compassionate things seem to make sense telling that person when it comes to our own struggles. Yeah, that's going to make me lazy. That's going to make me unproductive. I need to kick my own butt and right. work even harder. So it's that interesting dilemma there. But Diana uh, has, has a lot of things to say about how to deal with this situation. So I hope you all enjoy the interview with Dr. Diana Hill. Dr. Diana Hill is a clinical psychologist, an international trainer, and a sought-out speaker on acceptance and commitment therapy and compassion. She's the host of the podcast Wise Effort and author of the Self-Compassion Daily Journal, which is the book that I'll discuss with her today, and the ACT Daily Journal, which she wrote together with our very own Debbie Sorensen. And Diana is also working on an upcoming book titled Wise Effort. Diana works with organizations and individuals to develop psychological flexibility so that they can grow fulfilling and impactful lives. Welcome, Diana. It's such an honor to interview you on Psychologists of the Clock. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to be back and good to see you too. And we are talking about your newest endeavor, self-compassion and the journal, the beautiful journal that you wrote about this. And I have to say, when I discovered my passion for psychology, 
nine years ago and I got like deep into act and just general psychology, self-compassion seemed to be the up and coming new kid on the block. It seemed to be making its way into every book that I was reading. And in the, the 10 years before that, when I dabbled more in you know, self-development books, I didn't read any of it. So it, it took my stepping into psychology to hear of self-compassion. So maybe we can, we can start with a high level overview for those listeners who have no idea what, what self-compassion is and what I'm rambling on about. Uh, what is self-compassion? Well, it depends on who you're asking, right? So if you're asking psychological researchers or if you're asking contemplative practitioners, they might say a slightly different thing. So the, the field of self-compassion really took off with, I think, Kristen Neff's work. And Kristen Neff is a researcher at University of Texas at Austin. And she describes self-compassion as having these three components of mindfulness, kindness, and common humanity. I see that as, you know, when you're struggling, can you get present with whatever you're struggling with? And how are you relating to yourself? Are you being critical or harsh? Or are you being gentle and loving and encouraging? And then common humanity is the aspect of, do you recognize that everyone struggles? This is part of the, the nature of being human. And then there's a whole compassion-focused wing, uh, which is steeped in contemplative practice. And, and that compassion-focused wing looks at things like are you moving towards suffering and you're doing something to alleviate it, whether that's suffering in yourself or suffering in another person, and that compassion is more of a flow. So I kind of had a EVGB icky feeling about writing a book on self-compassion because I think that you can't really separate self-compassion from the compassion that we give others and our interconnection with others. And in psychology, we often want to land on it's all about the self as in me, myself, and I, as opposed to really looking at the, the nature of when you are kinder to yourself, you're actually probably going to be kinder to others. And I'm interested in that flow. Yeah, you wrote about three different flows of compassion. Um, and this, if I remember correctly, goes back to Gilbert and I'm going to butcher the name, Choden, um, mm -hmm. about 10 years ago, where you have this flow of giving compassion to yourself receiving compassion from others and then also offering compassion to others. And I don't know if it's just me, but giving compassion seems to be so much easier than receiving it from others. And the most difficult thing is giving compassion to myself. Yeah. People have different um, things with that. Like some people, it's really hard for them to give compassion to others. They're afraid. Like maybe if I'm kind to someone or I help someone out, they're going to need me more. And then some people are really afraid to receive compassion because maybe if I let somebody else help me, I'm going to become dependent on them or they're going to think I'm weak. Um, some people have a hard time with compassion for themselves. And there's, there's actually a whole field of research that Marcelo Matos has been involved in in terms of these fears that we have, fears of giving, receiving um, or self-compassion. And what the research shows, she did this study with over 21 different countries during COVID. And she found that folks who have higher fears of compassion actually fared worse in terms of their mental health during COVID. Mm. So it, it's, it's, it makes sense that we're afraid, you know, of compassion because it's not something that many of us are taught or we're encouraged to do, or maybe we, there's messaging that we have in our culture around it, but it actually does interfere with your ability to cope. And your ability to be resilient during difficult times, because we all need a little help. And, you know, I didn't go out to write this book on self-compassion, but it came as an offering to me from Matthew McKay. And so yeah. Matthew McKay helped Debbie and I publish this ACT Daily Journal. And the ACT Daily Journal was, has been really successful. It's one of the things that's been really helpful for folks in terms of taking ACT and putting it into practice, because there's and a lot a of theory out there. Book. Yeah, there's a lot well, of theory yeah. out there, but there's not a lot of necessary, like, then how do you do it? Like, what does it look like in your day-to-day -day life? And that was something that Debbie and I were really passionate about. And I was at a workshop with Matthew McKay at, at Worldcon, ACBS Worldcon, which is this big conference where all these people that are interested in contextual science come together. And I saw him at an empty table and I went and sat down with him during this workshop. And it was a workshop on the inner critic. 
And it was a real play workshop. So I didn't know that this is what was going to happen. But we ended up getting in this exchange where we were basically told to share an experience in our life that we have a tremendous amount of shame around and that we hold still today and that we blame ourselves for. So listeners can think about that. Like think about an experience in your life where you have a lot of shame around it and you still blame yourself for it. Does everyone have one? Do you have one? Do you have one? Uh, where do I even start? <laughs> yes, there is a, a whole like yellow pages coming my way. Yellow pages, but I is there what? And I'm not going to ask you to share it, but is there one that stands out for you? Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah? clearly. Okay. So I had one too. And, uh, and Matthew McKay had one. So here's this publisher of my book that, you know, he's pretty well known in the field and I'm sitting next to him and I'm, I'm asked to share that. And most of us, when we have those things that we don't like about ourselves or we feel shame around, we do one of two things. We either berate ourselves, we kind of rehash it, go over and over again, are self-critical, or we try and shove it away and not think about it. And then it pops out at these like really unhelpful times, right? So obviously, psychological flexibility, the capacity to you know, move towards your values, even with discomfort, is an important skill. But there's another important skill in there, which is how could you hold that thing that you have so much pain around differently with kindness and maybe allow some warmth and caring to come in? So I told him, and I'm actually telling people what this most shameful thing is now, because after I told him, it changed and in, in writing this book, it actually changed the whole way in which I relate to it. Mm. So I'll tell you what mine is, Michael. Okay. You ready? Yeah, uh, yeah ready. <laughs> so, so mine was um, when I was like 17 years old, maybe I was 16, I was in high school. I was really, really, really bulimic. And I used, I went to this like prep school that was super um, like preparing you to go to Yale and Stanford and all these things. On the outside, I had it all together. But I would drive home at the end of the day and I would get a ton of binge food, like cookies and cakes and a whole box of donuts. And I would go and drive to this public park that was on the way to my house. And I'd sit in the car and I'd eat all this food up in the car. And then I'd go into this public park bathroom and I'd go and purge. And one day I was purging in that bathroom. And, I, and a, a mom and a, and a little kid, like maybe like a three-year-old came in and I was purging and it, you know, little three-year-olds, what they do in public bathrooms and they go in, you know, mom, you, if you're a mom, you take them in the stall with you. She was, she um, looked under, like her little head poked under the stall and the mom said, honey, that is so disgusting. And from that moment for you know, up until 44, whatever, 43 years when I met Matthew McKay in that workshop room, I held that story about myself. I am so disgusting. Like I, like I felt, I mean, I can still remember that feeling in my bones. And it was this moment of telling Matthew McKay that he told me something that he thought was equally mm -hmm. disgusting, right? It was that moment where I actually experienced compassion for another person. I was able to take it in. And then he looked at me and said, you need to write a book on self-compassion. <laughs> and <laughs> from that moment on, you know, I, I mean, I've been working on self-compassion for years and years, but something shifted for me as I started to write this book, I started to dive more deeply into self-compassion, where it was no longer about, it's this cheesy thing that, you know, we have these three components of this and the four mm -hmm. steps of that. Technical. And it became a, more of a deeper dive into actually, what does it mean to meet the parts of yourself that you think are disgusting or that you're ashamed of? Or the, or the mistakes that you've made, or the ongoing stuff. I mean, it's not just when you're 17. It's like every day you're doing stuff that you don't feel so great about. What if you were to meet them with the same kind of kindness and compassion that maybe Matthew McKay met me, or maybe I've learned how to meet you know, myself with? It changes the, your relationship, and it makes you much more psychologically flexible, so much so that I can tell thousands of people this story now and actually not feel disgusted by it, because I know everyone else has a story that's similar including you. Yeah, that, that's true. Thank you for, for sharing that story. If anything, I'm really grateful that because of that little kid poking its head under the stall, a beautiful book got written that's going to help a lot of people. And as I'm thinking of my own 
big shame moments, I'm even more thinking of all the small stuff that is happening. Like you said, day in and day out, it's this, uh, these small things like, Michael, did you really have to eat that bag of chips? It's Michael, it's 11 a.m. How is it possible that you're not yet sitting in front of the computer and getting the work done? How is it that you've been uh, neglecting your workout for three days in a row? It's those small little needle pricks that are just there day in and day out, that, that inner critic that seems to, I, I like to think of the inner critic or I learned to think of my own inner critic. Uh, first, it was a very adversarial relationship. How, how dare you tell me all those bad things about myself? And plus, uh, you're actually right. And I started seeing my inner critic a little bit like my great grandmother, who was born 1909 when Germany still had an emperor and the Titanic <laughs> was still up and running. And she acted a little bit like an inner critic, but out of a very loving and kind reason. Like Michael would not leave the house without wearing three jackets. Michael would be told to to eat that, not do this and this, and how come you haven't done your homework yet? And came all came from this uh, place of compassion, caring for the little Michael who didn't know what he was doing. Um Luckily, my great grandmother was an amazing person. I still think about her every day, did it with a lot of love. And I read that love in her actions, but my inner critic seems to do it like a little prick that just wants to tell me I'm not, um, doing as well as I should be doing in the eyes of my inner critic. Well, often the inner critic has that, the sort of the functional analysis of it is that it's, it's to try and, um, improve you, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like, it has that edge to it. If you start to you ever have a conversation with your inner critic or do some um, kind of like parts work it, with it, you, you start to hear, oh, you're, you're here to kind of help me out like grandma. And you're misdirected in that, you know, it's like, it's, it's maybe it helps you out a little bit, but then it has this aftertaste of making you feel bad about yourself, right? And then what happens with that aftertaste of making you feel bad about yourself that you actually feel less motivated. And there's a lot, there's a large body of research now that definitely demonstrates that when we're harsh with ourselves, it actually makes us rebound, you know, not as effectively from stressors. We're less likely to stick with things. Uh, there's a, as you're talking about potato chips, I'm reminded of a study by um, Leary, Adams and Leary, where they had restrictive eaters come into a research room and they gave him a donut in the waiting room, which note to anybody, if you're in a research experiment, after you sign the consent form, you are now in the experiment. <laughs> so you're not in the waiting room when they give you a donut. The of donuts. <laughs> but they gave them a donut while they were waiting. And, and then half of the participants were assigned to a self-compassion intervention, which was as simple as saying, don't be so hard on yourself. Everybody eats a donut sometimes. And everybody in the study ate a donut, <laughs> you know, just a simple like, you know, kindness, common humanity, mindfulness. Let's just get started with the experiment. The other half got no intervention. And then they put him in this room, a taste test. And I'm using air quotes with the taste test, a taste test of Reese's Pieces, York peppermint patties and um, some other candy. Right. And they just gave him like ad lib. How much do you want to, you know, have this taste test? The folks that got the self-compassion intervention ate less mm -hmm. than the folks that didn't. Why? Because they were actually being kind to themselves. Maybe they were saying things like, oh, I've had enough sugar for today. Because when you practice self-compassion, you don't, it's not like you let yourself off the hook. And it's not that you let go of your standards. It's that you have more realistic standards for yourself. You're, you understand that we're all, we all are kind of a mess. We all have, you know, things that we struggle with. We all eat donuts sometimes. We all, whatever. And that practicing self-compassion is actually how can I be encouraging and warm and uh, the most wisest coach to myself possible. And when I can do that, then I'm actually going to make wiser choices. It's a little different than that kind of like being pushed by the critic. It's more being pulled by your heart. 
And that type of self-compassion, I see it as like these two wings coming together because when you have self-compassion and then it's supported by psychological flexibility, then you can start to pursue your values in ways that are um, much more effective, much more effective when you have like an, an awesome inner coach that's there to support you. So now I'm thinking the inner critic I can see clear evolutionary reasons for an inner critic uh, evolving because uh, a lone monkey is a dead monkey. So you better make sure that you hold up in the tribe and you're not you know, screwing things up. You're not the one who is like setting the village on fire and uh, get, getting the watering hole dirty or whatever, letting the sheep run away. So the inner critic steps in and says, hey, do your job, be careful and do a better job next time. When Self-compassion, however, is such a superior approach to this than being a critic. How come our internal operating system was like pre-installed with the inner critic and, and not self-compassion? Because I kind of want to give evolution the, the Microsoft award for installing a piece of software that I didn't want to begin with. Yeah, well, there's, I have two responses to that. One is that it's not all evolution. There's mm -hmm. also a cultural evolution that there's a lot of people that make a lot of money off of us feeling bad about ourselves. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. there's, um, you know, I see it as a Russian doll. It's like your brain evolved to have an inner critic. A lot of the, the evolution of the brain's inner critic is not make mistakes, obviously, yes, but it's also to fit in, right? So our brain evolved a critic to like keep us in line so that we can be part of the group and we don't say something that makes us ostracized. But then we also have, if we think about those stacking Russian dolls, We also have our early childhood experiences where we're internalizing, as you explained, your grandmother, our parents, our teachers, our coaches that get out the red pens. Or for me, it was watching my mom putting on her pants in the morning and, and just the, the negativity that she would talk about herself and her body mm. as she put on her clothes. She would never say anything like that to me as her daughter, but I watched her. I mm. watched her. I watched my dad working really late at night. And the way that he would talk to himself is he was, he was an attorney and he was preparing these cases and how harsh he was on himself. He would never be harsh on me about anything that I did, but I saw it. I heard it. So then we have the next Russian doll out, which is the culture that we're in, culture of discrimination, culture of oppression, culture of um, individualism, if you're an individualistic culture that you're listening to this from. And, uh, you know, a culture that is, uh, is about sort of like competition, yeah. right? So I better keep myself in line. And then we zoom out even more. And, and we also look at things like, you know, capitalism. So it's not just evolution. It's, it's this um, interaction of, and, and um, transaction of all these different pieces that contribute. And actually, I think it really helps like relieve some of our stress. Like, oh, it's not my fault that I have this. I would say we also, and what compassion focused therapy talks a lot about is we also have a whole compassion system that evolved. And that, that compassion system, whether it's called our social engagement system or our attend and befriend system or our rest and digest system, that compassion system is there to kind of, um, kind of like regulate our threat system in some way. And the compassion mm -hmm. system is one where we feel safe and connected <laughs> and, um, like that there's, Nothing that we need to change to have a sense of worth. I mean, when you, when you have a, ch if you have a child or a dog or a best friend that is easy to love, it, there's nothing that they need to change about who they are for you to love them. There's nothing that ha there's no performance or tricks or, you know, great. It's fun if your dog does some tricks, but that's not why you love your dog or why you love your kid or your best friend. And so when that is also our compassion system as well. And that's what's exciting about it is actually we can use this compassion system and a lot of the approaches that I use when I'm working with clients, self-compassion and compassion approaches are body-based ones because we're activating a different part of our nervous system. And I know you've had Stephen Porges on, I've had Steve Porges on the Wise Effort podcast as well. And that's what he's talking about when he's talking about social engagement and the vagus nerve is activating that system. So this makes a lot of sense to me. And I can also imagine, like, I'm just thinking through my own process of learning about self-compassion and, and bringing it into my life. And it seems to me that we've spoken about the lack of self-compassion uh, for whatever reason that is prevalent in, in our society, in our culture, and bringing self-compassion in and seeing ourselves 
with love, with unconditional love, like we would see our best friend, our puppy, our kid. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the, the in-between steps because mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to um, end my call with you and be like, oh, I got that one solved, right? Now I know how to do it. I'm, I'm air quotes, no, I'm doing the air quotes. I'm just going to love myself from here on out and I'm gonna be better. So here's a very generically phrased question for you. How do we do self-compassion? What are the action steps? Do you want to support psychologists off the clock and take good care of your favorite pet at the same time? Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. Use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50 at wholelifepet.com. My dogs, Tilly and Hazel, love the Tuscan Bistro Meal Mixer and the freeze-dried beef liver treats. The freeze-dried process is so cool. It retains up to 98% of the vitamins, minerals, and enzymes naturally occurring in food, which means no preservatives. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off. If you care about prioritizing your health as much as I do, and you want to support the podcast, you've got to try Thrive Market. Their online ordering is a breeze, and right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift when you join at thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that Thrive Market offers brands with really high quality ingredients and sourcing methods, and I really love the convenience of having everything delivered straight to my door. No crowds, no lines, no loading groceries in and out of the car in bad weather. So join me on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Just go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash POTC, thrivemarket.com slash POTC. And remember, supporting our sponsors is a great way to support us and the podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah, and there's also just this danger of going through the motions without actually feeling it, right? And uh, so, I guess I'm not an A, B, C, D kind of person because I feel like every person is different in terms of what's going to fit for them. For some people, the practice of self compassion is one where you're noticing that you're struggling in this moment. Maybe you're feeling a little anxious, as I am right now, a little anxiety in your body little heartbeat go in, a little stomach feels a little upset, maybe some thoughts that are um, feeling anxious. In that moment, you could do a body-based practice. So a body-based self-compassion practice is, can I notice the, the place in my body where I feel that anxiety? And could I bring just a little bit of exhale to that spot, a little bit of loosening up, a little bit of spaciousness, a little bit of holding it with warmth? Can I imagine sort of loosening and softening around that part of me that feels anxious? Another body-based practice may be something like, wow, I'm feeling a little anxious because I'm, I'm getting interviewed by Michael on this podcast <laughs> that I used to be on. You know, like that's a lot of anxiety. There's been some anxiety building up to this. Another body-based practice may be, I want to bring my wisest, most encouraging, compassionate self to this moment. So I can sit with a spine that is strong, shoulders that are dropped, eyes that are loving, a face that sees through, you know, sees another face that is loving and kind and sends love and kindness out of my, out of my pores, out of my cheeks, um, out of my eyes. So that would be an embodiment self-compassion practice. Some people are like, okay, I am not about the body. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to bring softness to my, the, you know, what's happening inside of me. I don't want to, you know, have a loving eyes. So maybe some people would really benefit from doing, especially I think when I work, when I coach with like, a, like leaders and CEOs and, you know, those types of folks, um, what I do with them is I do a little bit of compassionate self-talk. So think about a person in your life who's been like really wise and really helpful and really encouraging to you. 
And what would they tell you right now? And this is sort of the, you know, classic kind of stuff, but what would they tell you? And then could you start to rehearse that, you know, for yourself, doing a little compassionate self-talk? There's so many different practices out there. You could Google self-compassion practice and you'll get a million of them. Or get the and, journal. Get yeah. The or, or get the, <laughs> I'm sending people elsewhere. <laughs> Go get the journal. Um, but, but I really find that all of this stuff is individualized. And that's where the field of psychology is going, is what works for you. And what works for Michael is going to be different than what works for Diana. And you kind of got to try on some different stuff. You have to have that variability. So if evolution is variability, selection, retention, have some variability and then select what works after you try it. And if it works for you, then reinforce it, continue to do it and, and use it again and again. So there's, there's a question I actually had around this in my ongoing efforts of, you know, getting free therapy out of these calls. Something that I noticed with my um, self-compassion kicking in is that I think that let me give you an example um let it be a long work day today is actually a long work day uh, for me it's going to be 8 p.m when when we wrap this this interview or 9 or 10 if i can keep you longer and what's going on in my mind is you know what it's been a long day why don't you call it quits go to bed early watch a movie go watch some star trek just chill out which would be a self-compassionate behavior for me in that situation there's the other part, though, that says, hey, look, it's been a long day. You've been sitting all day. I think it would be really self-compassionate if you got on the cardio bike for half an hour and, you know, put some put some sweat into that T-shirt and, you know, get moving, get pumping a little bit, do, some, do something good for your body, which would also be a self-compassionate response. But the polar opposite of what watching Star Trek in bed would be how how choose which one of those polar opposites is the the way to pursue and how to decide how to deal with such a big question mark right well there's sort of a there's a compassionate answer to that michael i did expect nothing less yeah which is both of those sound really kind and when you feel like you have to choose one way of doing it right you know, I, I wonder if that's also part of the, that kind of critic mm. that it won't let you off the hook if you go to bed or it won't let you off the hook if you are on the bike that many of us feel that way. I, I feel that way too. Like, you know, I'm at work and I feel like I should be spending more time with my kids and I'm spending more time with my kids and I feel like I should be checking my email because I haven't gotten back to that client. And then I'm checking my email and I feel like I should be having sex with my husband. You know, it's like, no matter where I go. I, I can't seem to let myself off the hook, right? So sometimes the most compassionate answer is the answer that it doesn't have to be a certain way and that you could choose one thing. And, and when you choose, remind yourself of the values behind why you're choosing that. And it, I, there's also a psychological flexibility, mm. you know, component here of like, it sounds like you value giving yourself rest at the end of a long day. It also sounds like you value taking care of your body. And that I imagine that those values just sort of like, you know, if I don't feed my kids vegetables at breakfast, they'll, they'll probably get vegetables at lunch or dinner. And I don't have to beat myself up that they didn't have vegetables for breakfast, right? That at some point those values will be met and that maybe it can like hold it all a little bit more lightly for yourself. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's very true. It's that inner critic that wants to get um, everything perfectly right and have a very simple answer to the situation that it's then going to be right before because it wasn't perfect enough. Yeah. So it sounds like that is where psychological flexibility can kick in and diffusion comes my way. And uh, just holding those thoughts that the inner critic is sending me lightly and not fusing with them, not acting on them, but just letting them be there while I'm watching Star Trek and or putting on a sweat on the cardio bike, just let that inner critic sort of be on the sideline and, and, and watch me do whatever I decide to do. Yeah, there, there's this sort of dark side of, of wellness culture, or even the dark side of values. I have a good friend that will, um, she texted me once, that is act gone bad. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And, and act gone bad is feeling like I always need to do the hard thing. I always need to approach the most painful thing with psychological flexibility. And, you know, sometimes 
it, it's it's about like actually not having to do the you know doing the wellness perfectly or doing self compassion perfectly, and it's it's really more about being in, in the present moment, maybe listening in to um, what is it that you're yearning for. Like if you actually listen to your body about like, what is it that really just sounds like it would be kind and loving right now? And, uh, you know, these yearnings, actually I'm interviewing this week, I have um, Steve and Steve Hayes and Joe Sirochi come, coming on the Wise Effort podcast talking about yearnings mm -hmm. and how we evolved to have these six core yearnings that, that map onto the psychological flexibility processes, yearnings to belong yearning to feel, yearning to develop competence, um, yearning to make sense of the world, yearning to be oriented in our space and time. And another yearning I cannot remember right now because I'm just pulling this out of my head. So another one of them, you can listen to the show to find out the last one. But we have these, we have these yearnings. And then what happens? So even here and there, like you have a yearning to care for yourself after the end of a long day, right? So maybe it's connected and you also have a learning for competence. So maybe it's a, a you know, a, a yearning to be oriented and to have competence, but they get misdirected when we start to get caught in language in things like shoulds and expectations or it's supposed to look a certain way. And I find that it's really helpful, a really compassionate practice is to just drop a question into our, into our body, into our belly of like, what is it that I really yearn for right now? What is it that I'm like deeply longing for? Not the kind of yearning where like I'm opening the cupboards of the, of the kitchen. I'm yearning for some potato chips. Like in that moment, what am I really yearning for? And you may find that something comes to the surface if you just listen and get curious without having to have it figured out. Yeah. That leads me to, I, I guess, must be a, a standard question when talking about self-compassion. Um, and since you talked about working with with leaders and, and CEOs, I can imagine that that is a question that, that pops up for them as well pretty often. And this is the idea that self-compassion, will that not make me lazy? Will not that not mean that when I'm self-compassionate to myself, no, I'm doing the the easy things, the comfortable things. I'm going to you know cause the downfall of humanity. I'm going to cause the heat death of the universe because self-compassion without the stick behind me of the inner critic I'm going to go soft and lazy and I'm not going to do the hard stuff anymore. Yeah. So I actually wrote an article on this. I think it's, I think it's in mindful.org and it's um, an article on the three half truths of self-compassion and they're half truths because I, I actually believed them to be true, but I actually found out they're half true. And one of them is self-compassion is selfish. Self-compassion is hokey and self-compassion. I'll, I'll lose my edge. So you're kind of referring to the third one of I'll lose my head. We can talk about the other two, why, why they um, are half truths. And, you know, if you go to self-compassion researchers, they'll say, no, self-compassion actually enhances your performance. If you look at, you know, high performance swimmers, when they do a self-compassion practice, they actually, you know, perform better. If you look at, you know, lots of different studies have been done across on this. the board. Yeah. yeah, across the board. You look at academics. If you practice self-compassion, you're more likely to stick with a difficult math test, whatever. But I would actually say, you know, there's a half truth there about self-compassion will make you lose your edge. Mm -hmm. And that's where ACT comes in. Because where it will make you lose your edge is in places that don't matter to you. Ooh, because wow. You will... Let that detonate in your brain, dear <laughs> listener. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So for me, you know, I just go hard at everything. If there's a treadmill with a level 10, I'm like trying to make it a 10.5, right? That's, that's the way that I run most of my life. And what I am practicing, and, and this is also part of wise effort for me, is putting my energy in places that matter to me. And what self-compassion helps you do is figure out like, okay, I am going to be really kind to myself to the degree that I'm not going to start putting my energy in places that don't matter to me anymore. And I'm going to put high effort into what does matter to me and coach myself in a really encouraging way as I do and remind myself why I'm doing it. So you may just lose your edge. Like you may not clean up your house quite as perfectly when your friends are coming over because you realize what I really value is my friends coming over and not having a perfect home. And so, yeah, you might loosen up around some stuff, which is scary. But as long as you have those values and psychological flexibility on board, you're going to be okay. 
you're going to be okay because those those values, the values in psychological flexibility will, will help kind of orient you to the places that matter. And your self-compassionate self will encourage you to put energy there. Wow. Yeah, this is still this is still deconstructing itself in, in my mind. And I'm going through all the things that could be dropped task-wise or not be pushed as hard. And yeah, self-compassion would definitely need to come in. And on the other hand, I think uh, Chris Neff called it fierce compassion. Mm -hmm. It is the, the idea of the the, the firefighter who compassionately runs into a house to save uh, the people in there, uh, which is compassion, but it's this like fear warrior, like compassion that then can come in, in those moments when it seems that the compassionate thing to do right now is reach for the bag of potato chips. Well, in, so the fierce compassion, that term comes from Buddhist psychology so Kristen Ratneff wrote a book about it, but the terminology comes oh, from okay. Buddhist psychology. Yeah. And if you look at the, um, you know, the iconography and even the Hindu iconography around compassion, one of the early, um, my favorite Hindu goddesses that I used to chant to like early on when I was learning yoga is the goddess of Durga. And Durga is a goddess who holds a sword because she cuts through like ignorance. She holds a shield. She holds a conch shell so that she can speak her voice. I mean, there's very much this empowerment aspect of compassion because compassion is a source of energy. And when you start to view it that way, as opposed to compassion is weak or compassion is lazy, then you start to see, oh, okay, if compassion is a source of energy, it's an energy that's directed by love, then where am I putting that energy, right? And that sometimes it is quite strong. It, it has, you know, it has some fierceness to it. And sometimes it's, it's very soft and gentle. And you know, this brings me back to something that another one of those big aha moments that I had going through the workbook, it was right at the beginning, uh, where you described that when you have a new client come into practice, you don't ask them what problems bring them in, but you say, um, what is it that you care about that brought you here? which is just such a beautiful shift towards, yeah, you're not here to work on the problems. You're here to work on the really important things in your life that you actually want to tackle. Yeah. It's how I start workshops now too. When I um, lead workshops, whether it's for clinicians or for um, you know organizations, I'll just have people come into the room and I'll do this milling exercise. It's like musical chairs for therapists where oh. I'll put on music and then when the music and you kind of mill around and your job is just sort of walk around the room and see other people, like look at people in the eyes, you know, acknowledge each other. And when the music stops, you answer this question with whoever it is you're across the way for, from. You ask them, what is it that you care about that brought you here? And then they ask it back. And then the music starts again, you mill around and then the music stops. Musical chairs, stop wherever you are. Here's the next person. What is it you care about that brought you here? And you do that enough times. And I, I'll like, you know, when you're leading a workshop, you're just sort of paying attention to the tone and the pace of things. And you hear people start to lean in, slow down. Sometimes they hug each other. They've never met each other. They hug each other. People are tearing up, Right. Because you get to the matter really quickly when you start talking about what you care about. Like you, you get to a place where, you know, you see the common humanity that we, often it's we care about similar things, but you see the human behind the eyes. We could talk about our problems all day long and it, it has sort of that poison oak scratching the itch feeling yeah. of talking yeah. about it's problems. Easy to relate to. It's, it's easy, easy to, to relate over. to. And a lot of times that's what therapy is. You go in and talk about your problems for an hour. But I remember Benji Schoendorf um, at a training of his once, him talking about the matrix and, and how, which is a tool that you use in ACT to help you kind of identify when you're moving towards or away from your values. And he said, you know, most clinicians, most therapy, and most of us in general spend way too much time on talking about all the stuff that we don't like in our life. And we don't spend enough time talking about what it is that we want to grow. What is it that you care about that brought you here? And it lifts you up. It energizes you. It gives you that chi, that prana, that sisu, whatever word you want to use for it that can help launch you in a different direction. 
So I, it's a great tool. It's something I use with clients, but you know, you can do it with a, at a dinner party, select dinner party. <laughs> yeah. And musical chairs as well. Yeah. Have you ever had that experience where you've gotten cornered by that person on the airplane who just wants to talk your ear off? If you're anything like me, you may feel like you need to grin and be polite, but you should never feel that way when you're talking to your mental health provider. That is where ZocDoc comes in. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare hundreds of types of highly rated in-network doctors, including mental health providers, and instantly book appointments online. You can find mental health providers who offer in-person appointments, virtual visits, or both, whatever works for you. I love ZocDoc, and I know you will too. So if you want to check it out, go to ZocDoc.com slash POTC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated therapist, psychiatrist, or psychologist today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash P-O-T-C, ZocDoc.com dot com slash P-O-T-C. And remember, when you support our sponsors, you're supporting the podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, You're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. There's, there's something that you wrote in the book that I need to get printed on, on t-shirts and then become really rich. And then you're probably going to sue me. The, the quote from the book goes, instead of building the life you want, you spend a lot of energy trying not to feel bad. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, another thing that you wrote, and this was in regards to the inner critic, that when you give in to the inner critic, it's just going to show up more. And you also talk, and I think this is a little bit later, you write about watering the right seeds and where you want to put the water that you have in, in the garden. And that sparked in me a, a mindset shift where I was suddenly going through my day ever since I read that, going through my day thinking, if I'm going to do that thing that I'm about to do right now, I'm going to assume that I'm going to do more of that in the next weeks and the next months and going to get into the habit of watering the seed. Do I want that? And that was such a projecting that out into the, into the future. I'm going to be the gardener and every day I'm going to water the seed from here on out. I'm going to build the habit. And suddenly that tasty little thing, that um, unhealthy little thing, that whatever, insert small little distraction, small little something, something that wasn't done out of self-compassion, but that was done to get away from feeling bad. Do I want to keep watering that plant and turn it from a little sapling into a massive tree? So thank you for planting that seed in my brain, literally, literally yeah, there, and there's, figuratively. There's two people that come to mind when you talk about that. One is Cal Newport, who writes about for every, if you send an email, you're going to get an email. <laughs> yeah, All of us that are complaining about emails, we're watering the email seed by sending the email. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, just, no, just notice that. Okay. If you send the text, you're going to get a text, right? So the, the watering, there's that, but there's, That really traces to Thich Nhat Hanh. I mean, I, to give credit, that is one of his original teachings is the watering of the seeds in your mind. And which, which seeds are you watering? And I mean, he was sort of like an early uh, behavioral scientist where, you know, he was saying, if you water the seeds of hatred, if you water the seeds of greed, if you water the seeds of comparison, those are the seeds that will grow. And, and then they'll, then you'll actually have um, sort of the fruit of those seeds in your life and the tree and right. the, the everything fruit. The, the yeah, absolutely. So he would often say, you know, the, water, the seeds of mindfulness and mindfulness is, is both the seed and the fruit because you get to benefit from the experience in the here and now I would say water, the seeds of values. You get to experience the benefit of living your values. It feels good to water the seeds of your values or watering the seeds of compassion or self-compassion 
right here, right now feels good in your body. And then it's, so it's the fruit, but it's also a seed that keeps growing and spreads and there's a ripple effect and it impacts others. And that's also the type of seed that we want to water. We want, we want seeds that, you know, will grow fruit and then spread more seeds. Uh, so that goes to Thich Nhat Hanh, one of my first teachers. So giving him credit for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out and giving credit to the source. There, there was a, another exercise in, in in the book where you talked about, or where you you talked about a study by Hansen and Hansen on turning self compassion from this in the moment kind of thing to a long lasting trait, which I found. So I have a little story to share about this as well in my experience of living living the workbook. But uh, can you talk about that study maybe first to to set us up? Well, that comes from Rick, Rick Hansen, who's um, been a mentor of mine for a bit now. And he talks about um, positive neuroplasticity and from states to traits. So a lot of his work has been about uh, lingering on something long enough so that it actually gets into your brain, into your nervous system, right? And so the the practice of, um, you know, turning it from a state, just sort of like a feeling state that's passing more into a trait, which is something that you embody, requires you to kind of linger on it, like gratitude, right? Linger on it a little bit longer, let it seep in, or savoring the good of your life, or practicing compassion. And, you know, my experience of being around... Um, deep practitioners of compassion is that you see how they are when they're not on a stage or when they're yeah. not doing a teaching and yeah. it is the same practice of yeah. compassion so true the, the 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 particular exercise that that i was going through um and a very um, just on the right just the right day uh, it was my my birthday uh, Valentine's Day, in case any of the listeners want to send some late cake or birthday gifts, I'm still hoping for a pony. Um, I was going through this this particular exercise where we write about um, Hansen's work and to the the idea of savoring this compassion that we receive, whether it's being loved or being liked or simply being appreciated, being seen, and to kind of note that a little bit and to not fly over it, to not disregard it, but to bathe in it a little bit and then to maybe take the time and actually really savor it. And so I had my birthday party and a beautiful vegan burger place and with my best friends and we were sitting there and we sat until midnight and I came home. And what I would do is my evening routine, go in bed, read a book, turn on an audio book and, and fall asleep. And I said, no, this was such a nice evening. I'm going to savor that. And I put the book aside and I was just thinking about my friends showing up and having this good time and laughing together and them going into the next day a little bit sleep deprived because it's a work day and it's going to be late. And they did all of that so they could spend a couple of hours with me. And this could have been an evening that was nice. And then forgotten or not not forgotten but one of those many birthdays but now it feels like it's almost framed in my heart and it just sits there and that was just yeah that was just such a not just a beautiful way to spend the evening but a beautiful way of solidifying that memory and really honoring it with the framing that it deserved so thank you for putting that in the book. That was yeah. amazing. Well, and how many of us have had the other experience on our birthday night where we go to bed and we just rehearse the names of all the people who didn't call us <laughs> or we rehearse all of the <laughs> they things. They know who they are. No, yeah, just <laughs> who, where it didn't go right or or we rehearse all the yeah. things that we were embarrassed of that we said after, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that or, oh, why didn't I do that? And then we're watering those seeds, right? So in that example, you're watering the seeds of feeling loved and feeling cared for, and that will change the neurochemistry of your body and how you feel in your body. And it also makes you more alert to love and care because they're getting strengthened inside of you. So it's shifting back to the beginning when we talked about, you know, sort of threat system or, or compassion system, you're shifting yourself on purpose into your compassion system. On purpose. And then you'll show up more 
for people that you love, probably from a loving space. So it's it's a flow. Back to the beginning, <laughs> it's a flow. You're more likely to share that with others. So savoring is a great. It's a positive psychology practice. There's a, again a not, another area where there's a ton of research around savoring. And uh, you know, I'm sort of all about put your energy where it matters most, and then savor the good along the way. You know, savor it because. We don't know when we're if we're going to have another birthday like that again. Happy birthday! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, that's so. Is there anything coming coming up to the end of our time together? Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? Oh, there's a ton of things we haven't covered that I like to talk about. Great. But that's why. <laughs> but, there's the but. That's why I keep talking. I have a um, podcast, the Wise Effort Podcast. So if you are interested in any of these these topics. And it's changed a little bit because I was doing interviews for so many years. I mean, I've been doing whatever, seven, eight years now. And I started realizing, wow, I kind of want to do something a little different. So I launched the Your Life in Process podcast. And then I got in my old, my old pattern. Mm. <laughs> Don't we all do this? My old pattern of interviewing people and trying to find people that are, you know, amazing to interview. And then I made this shift to the Wise Effort podcast just a couple of weeks ago. And it's different in that I have a a, a, a session a, a month where I'm doing a skill building short 20 minute, 15 minute little here's a skill to try for the week because I am interested in theory, but I'm also interested in practice. And then I have a real play, which is me demonstrating like as if you were in a therapy room, me demonstrating a skill. And uh, whether it's demonstrating a passion skill or an act skill, but I don't, I kind of pre, pre plan, but once the person comes in, they, they come in what they come in with. So I just kind of respond as if, you know, this is real. I'm not going to like um, get too pre planned with this stuff. So wait, wait. So now I'm, now I'm curious who's yeah. the person that is coming in? Oh, all sorts of people. Sometimes they're other therapists. Sometimes they're not my clients because that's not ethical. Like this past week, I had somebody come in who's um, a CEO of a fitness organization and pretty well known um, in our sort of in the Santa Barbara area and uh, wanted to make it was interested in making a career change. So we did a real play around that. And it came up as, um, you know, doing sort of some visualizations around that and making a shift. And then the third type of um, episode that I have is, is a wisdom episode. Mm -hmm. And that's where I bring in wise people. And that's why Steve Hayes and Joe Sorochi are on this week, because they're some of the wisest researchers that I can think of. But other wise people that aren't always researchers. So you still do interviews um, as, as well? Still do interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my, my tendency for pretty much ever has always been about like, Uh, seeking, 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 seeking. I'm a, I'm a big seeker, seeking out other people's ideas and information. And I'm at the point in my life and in my career where I'm, I'm ready to just practice. Like, I don't know if how much more seeking I need to do. I need to do a lot more practicing, a lot more practicing of the things and ideas and, and also listening to my own wisdom yeah. as well. Beautiful. Um, definitely everyone check out wise effort with, uh, Dr. Diana Hill, any, any other places, resources, social media, I'm going to use the bad word, uh, you want to send our listeners and we're going to put all of that in the show notes as well. Of course. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm on Instagram reluctantly on Instagram, but I am there. Um, always a mixed bag. And um, I'm on Insight Timer if you're interested in meditation. I have a number of meditations there. YouTube things, all my podcasts are on YouTube. So if you like to see things versus listen to things, that's just another way to um, look at those. And for those that are clinicians and want to learn more about process-based therapy, I have um, a six-hour workshop with Steve Hayes and Joe on PESI, on process-based therapy. Um, so that's just another area that's sort of a side interest of mine. And I'm involved in the Psych, Psych Flex app that, um, Steve Hayes has as well, if you're interested in that. So. Oh, I saw you talk about the, um, the TV in the restaurant or in the sports bar. Oh, uh, that was like, oh, I know Diana, and that is yeah. such a good metaphor. I'm totally going to steal it. And, uh, if you all want to know what the sports bar metaphor is, you're gonna, you're gonna get the app. <laughs> you're gonna get this Psych Flex app. Yeah. to get more of Diana as well. Thank you so much for spending this hour with me, Diana. This was a true honor. 
And what a happy coincidence it was that I got to read that workbook because as you could tell from the interview, there were a bunch of light bulbs that went up in my brain and made my life better um, since I read it and hopefully it's going to water the right seeds. Not hopefully, I'm, I'm very confident that it's going to water the right seeds from here on out and spread them everywhere. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Michael. And thanks for just being a compassionate, kind person to me and welcoming me, welcoming me back in the way that you did to this um, show. So I really appreciate you having me back. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter and connecting with us on social media. We'd like to thank our podcast production manager, Jadine Stout-Williams. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com. 